uh, the latest um, lunchtime talk on our School of Law seminar series. And before I introduce our speaker today, could I ask everyone to put their mics on mute and switch off their cameras until the end of the session? And likewise, just to advise that by participating in today's session, you're actually giving your consent to the session being recorded. Um, our talk today, um, we will field questions at the end. There'll be plenty of time for that. and. Um, I think it's better if we leave them until the end of the session, though I'm sure Emma won't mind if anybody interrupts with a clarification question as we go through. But I'd like to welcome our speaker today, who is Dr. Emma Jones, a senior lecturer in law and director of student well-being at the University of Sheffield's Law School. Her research interests focus on the role of emotions and well-being in higher education, legal education and the legal profession. And Emma is someone whose work I am very familiar with and who our colleague John Stannard has presented with and and um, worked with in the past. Emma's monograph, Emotions in the Law School, Transforming Legal Education Through Passions, um, was published by Routledge in 2019. And I'm delighted to have Emma here with us today and to talk about emotions in the law school and legal education. Thank you, Emma, and I'll hand over. Thank you, Heather, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here today. If you just bear with me, I will bring up my slides. There you go, hopefully. You can see those now. Um, I, I'm afraid while I'm sharing, I can't seem to see the chat box. So if you do have any um, questions, please if, feel free to, to interrupt me um, along the way. So um, my starting point to today really is that I was a solicitor in private practice. I went to law school, I was a solicitor, and then I went and did a PGCE uh, to train as a teacher. And one of the things they encourage you to do is be a reflective practitioner and reflect back upon your own experience of education, particularly higher education. So I spent a lot of time reflecting on my experience at law school, which I think is probably a fairly typical one for that particular time, um, late 90s. And um, I realised that emotion and well-being had just never really been talked about they hadn't been on my radar at all as things that were relevant or important and when I thought about my time as a solicitor I, I realized it was the same really um, emotion and well-being had obviously been present and sometimes when you're dealing with clients you'd had to kind of maybe have a box of tissues at the ready but but actually it wasn't really discussed it wasn't really explored so that sparked my interest in um, the role of emotion and well-being in legal education and the legal profession but before i go on to talk a bit about that i just wanted to ask you something uh, so it sounds like you're still where, where we are in the semester and that you're still teaching and it's still quite heavy going. But I was interested to know if you could give me three emojis or words that describe this semester for you so far. Oops, sorry, I'm going on there when I don't mean to. So, um, as I said, I'm, I'm struggling to see them. Emma, it might be easier if people want to come in using the raised hands function and I can moderate that or um, give you an idea of what types of comments are coming up on the chat bar. That, that would be fabulous. Thank you. If people want to go ahead. I'm happy to do that. Oh, typing started. What are the what are the emojis for tiring and frustration? <laughs> frustration. <laughs> I would I, I go for those two to start with. Yeah, I've realised most of them are quite positive on the screen and that might not be reflective of where we're at at this point in the semester. OK, I, I can see a worried emoji appearing up. Uh, Rachel's crying <laughs> angry and sweating. Yes, I like. John Stannard, happy but tired. Okay, I'll click through some more of these. Um, I'll see who else is coming up here. Declan, I wonder is there a way of, of sharing the chat bar? Um, I'm not sure. OK, I, I'm happy to do it this way then. Um, Deirdre challenging, isolating, but driving forward. A um, couple of others here, let me say, just to get a flavour. Um, this semester, Martin, unrelenting, rewarding, but frustrating. So does that give you some sense, Emma, of where we are to start with? And we can have a look at some of the others. <laughs> yeah. 
that that's great because I think that, that is I mean it's always interesting to ask that and it's always quite nice to hear people probably feeling the same as I do um but the other thing Can I interrupt you surreal unbalanced and I don't know I think that's angry <laughs> and challenging surprising and rewarding so we've got a mixed bag there Emma sorry go yeah. ahead no, that's brilliant. Thank you, Heather. So, yeah, it, it's good good to hear that. Um, and it's also, I think it's just one little example of how if you ask people to describe their semester, um, they will usually use words that ev evoke emotions, that evoke issues around well-being. It's just one little example of the ways in which emotion and well-being are important within our daily lives and within our workplace, within the law school. So my, my, my kind of overriding argument, um, which it's uh, it kind of I'll keep coming back to throughout this, this, this talk, is that actually emotions and emotional well-being are relevant to every part of the law school experience, whether it's learning, whether it's teaching, whether it's the overall experience that students have of legal education. And I also think there's an interesting point here, which is the bottom diagram which is about it's not just about students and their emotions and their well-being it's also about staff and their emotions and their well-being now I also think it, it's a bi-directional relationship so it, how you are feeling your emotions your well-being will impact on learning teaching and the law school experience whether you're a student or a staff member but equally the way that law school operates the way that the teaching takes place the learning takes place the culture within the law school all these elements will also impact upon students and staff's emotion and well-being and sometimes I think partly because of that and because of wider institutional pressures, there's there's a um a tendency to to suggest that actually um when staff um are are feeling um there's a tension between staff and students and how they feel. So that if students are needing a lot of emotional support and they're going through a difficult time, then actually that's going to have a negative impact on staff because they have to give greater support. Uh, whereas if students are, are feeling happier and more emotionally stable, then actually the staff well-being will, will, will be higher because they won't be giving that support. So there sometimes can feel like there's a tension between student and staff emotions and well-being. And that, I think, is often driven by the, the sort of wider institutional setup and the way that workloads are counted and all those different kind of issues. But what I wanted to do to illustrate the ways in which I think emotions and well-being are relevant in the law school is trace the student's journey through law school, but trace it in terms of emotion and well-being and also look a little bit at how that might play out for those students who do go on into the legal profession eventually. So we're going to start the journey with the transition into law school. And the key point here is that actually this is an incredibly emotional experience for students. There, there's a huge shift in terms of the type in, of environment, in terms of often uh, where they're going to be living, their geographic location. Um, there are lots of elements that make the tr transition a hugely emotional experience. Um, I'm going to do a bit of a research mashup here. My my teenage children tell me I should never use that word, I'm too old, but I like it. Um, but some of the data I'm drawing on here is from when I was part of the research team for the University Mental Health Charter. Some of it is from other personal research projects. Some of it is is, is uh, more theoretical projects. Um, but some of the well, one of the things I've worked on is a paper around transitions to university from um, empirical data from staff and students for the Mental Health Charter. And they they all raise these issues that actually students don't feel well prepared. Um, students felt that they hadn't been given the necessary skills and staff also felt that students weren't always prepared, both in terms of academic skills and general life skills, putting on a washing machine, for example. And there was a real sense that it was important for students transitioning to university to have strong support networks and have that sense of belonging and sense of community and to do that it needed this inclusive supportive culture or what sometimes termed a whole university approach it wasn't sufficient to have a session that talked to students about this is what you're going to you know going to be doing for the next year it had to be more of an inclusive broader approach than that 
and that involved more provision as well for, for, for example, for student mental health services and to acknowledge kind of diversity amongst students and what they're experiencing. So, of course, when a student comes to university and law school, one of the things they may well do is move into residential accommodation, whether it's owned by the university or privately owned. And again, this is going to have a huge impact on their um, emotional experience and upon their well-being. So again, for the University Mental Health Charter, um, we the staff and students talked about the impact of residential accommodation. They talked about the difference it can make if, for example, you are in um, you know, a small flat with no communal area, as opposed to somewhere with some green space nearby. They talked about the impact of house and flatmates, whether you gain emotional support from them or whether actually it can be very difficult living with people perhaps who you don't know or don't know very well. And that can actually be really emotionally draining and difficult. And often there was a sense that, that some very traumatic things were being experienced at weekends or late at night, such as, for example, suicide attempts. Um, and then there, weren't the, there wasn't the support there. There weren't the staff there who were trained necessarily to deal with it because uh, it was outside of normal working hours. And I think my point here is that um, perhaps we are not all involved in the, the issues around transition to university and uh, residential accommodation, but all of this is something that when a student sits in our classroom in a law lecture, in a law seminar, or even online when they log in, this is all things that they are experiencing that will be impacting upon their engagement, their motivation, the way they approach their learning. It's all things that are relevant to teaching and learning within legal education. And that is why sometimes this is the argument I quite often get about my research. Yep. That's great, but actually emotions and well-being, they're not to do with us as academics, they're a pastoral concern. We have student support services. It's a bit like the Stanley Fish argument in Save the World in Your Own Time, where he says, uh, you know, academics shouldn't be involved in teaching values. It's, it's not in our comfort zone. We don't know how to do it. We won't do it very well. I think the reality is that emotions and issues of emotional well-being are always present in any kind of teaching and learning setting. So it isn't a case of um, deciding whether to allow them to be present or not, because they are present whether you want them to or not. I think the key is that then you have to make a decision about how you deal with those. Do you ignore them? Do you suppress them or do you actually acknowledge them and use them to enrich the learning and teaching experience? And my argument, you won't be surprised to hear, would be for the latter. In terms of studying and learning law, I think there has been a tendency, and this is a very much a generalisation, but law has tended to prize a particular type of reason and rationality. And in intellectual terms, it's seen as purely cognitive uh, in nature. So in contrast to that, there's a kind of Cartesian dualism where emotion is seen as irrational, unreasonable, and therefore it's something that law students need to get used to suppressing, to get used to ignoring. And we sometimes see this in the term thinking like a lawyer, which kind of encapsulates sometimes a very rigid, very narrow, specifically legal, analytical frame of mind that completely disregards um, emotion and effect more generally. And um, unfortunately, I think this actually goes against pretty much all the evidence that's out there from psychology, from education, from neuroscience, which all suggests that actually Emotions and cognition are intertwined. You can't say this is a purely cognitive function because it never will be, because emotions impact on every part of our lives, from our judgments, our decision making, our motivation, our engagement. All these issues are influenced by emotion. And if we didn't have emotion involved in them, then actually what we term as reason and rationality would be dry and stale. So. In the legal classroom, I think that thinking like a lawyer is, is connected to this sort of idea of objectivity and rationality, which the law so often seems to prize. And I think one example of that is when you look at case law, and obviously you're trying to extract legal principles from cases, usually appellate cases, 
But actually, how often do we remind students about the faces behind those cases and behind those legal principles and the emotions that will have been involved during those cases, even some cases that we may see as very dry? Uh, what I always think of is um, economic loss and Murphy and Brentwood um, Borough Council because um, I teach law of obligations, um, where actually it seems quite a dry case, but actually behind that there's there's somebody who had a home that wasn't inhabitable, there's all this emotional experience going on. And actually, how often do we capture that side of it for our students? Um, and I suspect it's not as often as we perhaps should. And there is some research around law student wellbeing that suggests that actually prizing this type of thinking like a lawyer can be damaging to wellbeing. Um, there's, there's these elements of competitiveness and pressure. There's a sense that everybody is an individual and needs to focus on, you know, their own intellectual development rather than connecting with others. And it ignores that intuitive thinking, those little nudges that our emotions give us, those cues that they give us that can help us develop our thinking in, in different areas. So, some of the things um, I suggest as potential solutions for this are just simply raising awareness around the importance of emotions and well-being, and that can be amongst staff, and it can also be amongst students, just letting students know that actually you will have emotions connected to your learning and teaching can be really, really valuable. Um, in, in our law school, we've just introduced um, some um, student wellbeing ambassadors and actually having those students openly talk about emo emotions and wellbeing has, is, is something that I think could really positively shift the culture within the law school in the longer term. I just it, hopefully it will become part of the normal discourse, the everyday discourse that we have both within teaching and learning and in the wider law school settings. I think another thing that we can do as educators is modelling emotional literacy. If we have an upsetting case, maybe there is a sensitive content warning on it. Maybe it's perhaps not one that where we need a sensitive content warning, but maybe you find it a little bit upsetting for a reason or there's something difficult about it. And I think it's OK to be open about that and explain that and explain how you're dealing with that and how you're processing that rather than right, we've looked at that case, let's just move on to the next thing, forget about how we felt. It's it's kind of letting yourself explain that you can deal with these in different ways that involve acknowledging these ideas. I think a key thing is about reflection as well, fostering a reflective approach. I think gradually over the years, law schools have become much, great, much better at fostering um, reflectivity in terms of learning. But as I said, learning is not just a cognitive experience. So we need to think, are we encouraging students to reflect on their emotional responses, those emotional cues they might be getting about how they feel towards a topic, how they feel towards an assessment? And another area I think um, that's valuable is the idea of empathy. So empathy has cognitive and affective parts. It's, it's, it's a perfect demonstration, really, of how cogn cognition and effect are intertwined together and cognition and emotions. Um, but it really gives people that that sense that they can use that, have that intuitive thinking, have that emotional response, but then also reflect upon it and um, put themselves in someone else's shoes, but at the same time remain separate and be able to, to um, think through their response. So, I didn't feel that I could talk about learning and teaching without talking a little bit about the so-called online pivots. So um, obviously, um, you're, I'm guessing you're pretty much in the same situation as me and, and haven't really been on campus recently. And certainly we haven't had any students on campus um, pretty much all of this academic year. But I think it's really important that we acknowledge that this is an incredibly emotional experience for students and one that will impact upon their well-being. Uh, I did some research on distance learning in the past at the Open University and my colleague and I at Sheffield also did a student survey about students experience during the first lockdown from March to June of last year. And it was very clear that students motivation had been badly impacted. Overall, it, there was a mix, but actually students often felt that they couldn't achieve any kind of work-life balance and they felt incredibly isolated. 
they didn't feel part of a, a community any longer. Often they seem to um, relate the idea of community to actually physically being on campus. And it seemed that they didn't find our attempts to recreate that digitally um, particularly persuasive overall. So I think we have to be aware as we hopefully come out of um, lockdown and the restrictions and move back to some form of normal, that actually the emotions and the experience of this year will be something that has long term repercussions for both our students and, of course, for us as staff as well, because we also had to make that shift. So. I, I couldn't, um, the other thing I had to really mention when I was talking about teaching and learning was also assessments, of course, because um, they are, whether we like it or not, a significant part of the law school experience. So I'm hoping I've just got time to ask you, what, what do you think the emotional impacts of assessments tend to be? Again, everyone, everyone to use, use the hands, hands or, or type, type. Probably, probably raise hands. Raise hands. Martin? Martin? Uh, just, yeah, a just a quick point. point. I, think I think that, that, that it depends, depends on the type of assessment, type of assessment because, because with, with exams, exams that are um, in, in real time, real time I, think I think students can have can a sense have of dread. dread. Sorry, there's, there's a lot of interference, lot of interference here. here. Um, um, with take home exams, though, I think that students can be more relaxed about it. So I think it depends on the sort of assessment. Uh, I see a few of comments in the chat bar again. We see there seems to be an acronym for me. Um, panic in some cases. I'm seeing stress. Just typed replies to this. Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I think they're quite, they're quite potentially negative um, emotional responses overall, particularly, I think, uh, as Martin said, if it's kind of what, what students might term as high stakes assessment, like, like an, an examination where it's a kind of feels like an all or nothing thing. Um, Certainly, again, going back to some uh, university mental health charter research we did, we we, we found, um, again, that these negative emotions were quite commonly raised around assessment by students. Um, and one of the things um, we, we about my colleagues and I suggested around this is that actually the key thing is that you need to, when you're designing and delivering your assessment, you do need to factor in a consideration of students' emotional response and the impact upon students' well-being. And of course, there is no single one way uh, that's the right way to assess and it will be discipline specific and it will be you know, depend if there's requirements from a professional body and so on. But actually, some of the kind of things to think around is there's, there can often be a tension between um, you wanting to challenge students and stretch them and encourage them to, to, you know, develop in terms of their learning. But at the same time, for students, this can be perceived as a psychological threat. So it can generate those negative emotions um, because they're they're unsure how to deal with it particularly law students often tend to have performed very well prior to, to law school and if they come to law school sometimes it can feel like a real shock to the system because maybe it's the first time they've experienced this sense of failure and there's this sense of competition there so other things to think about could be that type of assessment, there's the examinations, which can be associated with a lot of stress and anxiety. But at the same time, to some extent, I think students almost expect them and that they're, they're used to them. They understand what they need to do for an exam. Whereas if you move to more novel forms of assessment, actually, um, it may feel more creative. But at the same time, that may in itself pose a threat. And this came out very clearly, I think, when we, we talked to participants about the idea of collaborative assessments and group work and presentations and students finding that very difficult because of the emotional dynamics involved in group work, whereas at the same time it seemed to impart valuable skills to them. And this idea that obviously every student will respond at least to some extent in a different way and how, how much can you you know, um, tailor your assessment to individual students in, in light of the practicalities of, of workload and marking and so on. A big issue that arose in our research as well was around feedback. The idea that as staff, we want to give feedback to help students progress in their learning and be constructive. 
but often it can be interpreted by students as them receiving criticism and it can be internalised and again lead to this, this sense of, of, of failure or being attacked in some way and how to get that balance. And there's no easy answers to this, but I think it's important to acknowledge these kind of tensions that are involved when we are looking at assessment. I just wanted to finish by briefly thinking about uh, students transitioning away from the law school and into the workplace. And of course, the trans transition away from law school can in itself be an extremely emotive experience. Um, it's not necessarily an easy one. And I'm going to focus on the legal profession here, although I acknowledge that there are many law students who don't want to or don't end up going into the legal profession. But um, I've done a fair bit of research around the legal profession. And one of the themes that constantly comes out is that um, students moving into the profession don't always feel prepared. They, they don't feel prepared practically necessarily, but they don't feel prepared in terms of their well-being and um, the emotional um, aspects that they're going to have to navigate. One solicitor described it to me as, as an emotional roller coaster. And often um, they may have unrealistic perceptions of what it is actually like to be a lawyer. Maybe they've been watching Suits or, or maybe it's just simply um, a lack of awareness of the realities of practice in different areas on diff different um, topics. And when, when we ran some focus groups with legal professionals, we, we found there were a really varied range of experiences, but people did have a sense of real pride in their work as legal professionals. They saw it as meaningful work. For some, it was about the status. It's, it's you know, they, they liked the idea that, they, that people went to them for advice, that there were financial rewards perhaps, but a lot of it was about this meaningful work that gave them this motivation to carry on and do the work. But at the same time, a lot of people talked about this real pressure to hide those emotions. It's going back to that idea of thinking like a lawyer. Um, it was that idea of having to be strong as a lawyer. And if you showed emotion, you would be showing weakness. And therefore, you know, if you were a barrister, uh, you wouldn't be hired to represent anybody. If you're a solicitor, your clients wouldn't approve of that. So it was very much about concealing and suppressing emotion. Having said that, some people did talk about using emotion and empathy in very carefully managed ways that the idea of building a rapport with a client actually by um, um, using a sense of empathy putting yourself in their shoes so you could experience what they were going through that was referred to by some people as a kind of useful tool to them but it was within very very limited boundaries and there was a sense really that anything to do with emotion conflicts in some way with professionalism it, it's something that, that the legal profession doesn't seem to have fully acknowledged as an important competence within their frameworks to date. So, oops, there we go. I managed to uh, jump past the any questions slide. Never mind. Uh, so really, that was the end of our journey back through um, the, the student's journey. And the key point is that it's for students it's not just a learning journey it's an emotional journey it's a journey in terms of well-being and all of that will impact upon the way they are and the way they perform within legal education and of course their experience of legal education will impact upon their emotions and well-being and it will also impact upon the staff equally so I'd be really happy to take any comments or questions you might have Thank you very much, Emma. Um, sorry, can I just check if everyone's mic is muted? Because there seems to be a little bit of bounce back. Um, so I, I suggest we use the raised hands function. Um, people want to jump in and ask questions. I, I might kick off and ab abuse my my cherished privilege if that's okay, Emma. <laughs> um, I found the talk fascinating. There's a lot to think about there, and. I mean, we're all very conscious of our support um, and our well-being um, roles in terms of how we deal with our students these days. The one thing that I, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about, what about, yes, we have to appreciate and understand all these conflicting emotions, but where does building resilience come into it for the students? Because whenever you think about it, you know, um, when you transition to professional life, you cannot be insulated your entire life from negative emotions. You are going to be criticized in a work environment. 
if you do something that's wrong, your employer is going to tell you that's wrong. So yes, the supportive functions, yes, I, I get that. But what sometimes concerns me or concerns me quite a bit in the university environment these days is where do we go about building resilience? Thanks, Heather. That's a really good point. And yeah, uh, so resilience is important and resilience in the terms of being able to adapt appropriately to new situations and new challenges as they arise. So in that sense, it's a neutral concept and it is important to to build that in. So encouraging students to be, say, aware of their emotions and to ask for support when they need it doesn't mean saying to students, you know, you should kind of wallow in your emotions, but it's about equipping them to deal with their emotions and to become more resilient. My slight concern is, and, and this is something I've seen a lot in the legal profession, but possibly it then filters back to legal education, is the term resilience, I think, is misused. So um, in the legal profession, it is often used um, to focus on individual resilience. And it's often used in a way that says to people, basically, you need to be as tough as you can to survive within this profession. You know, if if you feel upset, if, if you can't cope anymore, it's your problem. You know, you need to go and, and get some counsel and whatever, fix yourself and get back to work. So I think resilience is often used in quite a toxic way in certain environments, whereas in fact, say in the legal profession, actually a lot of the reasons why a person might be struggling might be nothing to do with them they may have great coping mechanisms but they're in a really toxic workplace um you know they've got huge pressure in terms of billable hours charging tar uh, chargeable hours um you know financial pressures all those kind of things that actually it shouldn't be about just the individual making themselves as tough as possible. We have to acknowledge that a lot of things that impact upon people's emotions and their well-being are external to the individual. And yes, we should definitely equip people to deal with those and equip students to deal with those the best we can, but also acknowledge that it's not all about the individual. Thank you, Emma. Um, I'll hand over to other people for questions. There's a lot to take away from this. John. Sorry, John, go ahead. Hello, can you get an echo? Are you getting an echo from me? Or can you hear me? I can hear you, John, and no echo. No echo, that's good. I mean, one thing I am very was very, um, when I started as an academic, I was virtually given no teach, no training whatsoever in how to teach. I was just put in front of the class, and uh, this was back in um, 1974, just pretty well put in, I think we got about two afternoons. To what extent do you think should academics be trained in the way that school teachers are trained? Can we learn anything from the way that school teachers are trained? Oh, hi, John. It's lovely to lovely to hear your voice again. Um, yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, personally, I I think we could. So I mentioned I did a PGCE, which yeah. wasn't. Um, focused on higher education and I actually taught 16 to 18 year olds as a result but the one thing I took away from that was about being a reflective practitioner and really thinking through your your, your the ways you teach and why you're doing a certain thing and and linking the theory behind it to the actual practice and I think that's incredibly valuable so I think that and I think people like Fiona Cowney have argued this in the legal education literature that there is a real role for for training and support for for, for newer um, legal academics to ensure that that they have those skills I think unfortunately sometimes um, research is really, really prioritised to the extent that sort of teaching is 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 kind of um, not developed in the way it should. Although maybe I don't know, maybe that that that's changing, and it might be um, you know dependent upon specific institutional policies. Yes, in my day, I mean, it was a, uh, in my young youth, it was a matter of pride to be a bad teacher. 
Because there was a teacher, you know, that there was this saying: a popular teacher is a bad teacher. I'm tempted to type a laughing emoji somewhere if I could yeah. do it quickly enough. Yeah. Adi. Yes. Hello. Um, thanks, Emma. Um, I really, really was looking forward to to your talk, and I really it was really very insightful. I just wanted to get your thoughts on you know, to properly put in place everything which you, you, you discuss. Is there a need? I mean, what do you think is better to have somebody in the law, in, within the law school who is well versed, knowledgeable of these areas, whether it's, a, whether it's a law academic or a non-academic? Because currently the structure is we have a different department in the school that deals with student well-being. And in my own personal opinion, I think it's a quite bureaucratic process which is where, you know, you want something to be looking into, but it takes quite some time, you know, before anything is done, which in my own personal experience has not been so helpful. So what would you advise? Would it be better that we have a law academic who probably in their working allocation is dedicated to this, or a, a non-academic who's, you know, non-law person who is there solely to focus on these issues? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think um, obviously there's always a need for external support services outside of the, de the, the department or the law school that you, you, you can regularly signpost students to who can give more specialist and, and in-depth help. However, I think there is a, an important role for somebody within a law school to actually look at well-being issues. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. I think the first one is there is a significant body of research specifically on law student well-being. And I think if, if somebody is versed in that, um, I think that's incredibly useful. It also tends to suggest that law student well-being is worse than that of other um, students studying different disciplines within um, higher education. So there is a suggestion that law students fare particularly badly because of particular issues related to the study of law, not least this idea of thinking like a lawyer and the kind of um, way that that is promoted. So I think there are specific things around law and how it's taught that somebody within a law school is well um, placed to challenge. And I also think the other reason that academic involvement is important is because there is a need for what's often termed this whole university approach. And part of that is thinking very explicitly about emotions and well-being within the curriculum, within learning and teaching. So that needs someone with some familiarity, I think, with a particular discipline to be able to start to develop some kind of guidelines, some kind of best practice ideas, or at least to lead that conversation within the law school about actually are we integrating well-being? Are we integrating discussion of emotion into our modules? How can we do that? Where should we do it? So that I think that there's lots of value in having um, a legal academic involved. I'm director of student well-being for my law school, and I actually have a team of um, five deputy directors who are involved in things like personal academic tutoring, in um, um, widening participation, various different areas but I, I personally think that works really well because we have a huge pool of experience between us and we can really really focus on the needs of our law school as well as working with the wider faculty. Thank you I totally agree with all the points you raised thank you so much. Thank you Adi any other questions any comments that anybody would would like to make Martin? Hi, I think there's no echo this time, so that's great. Um, it was really just to pick up on a few things that have been said. I mean, I completely agree with Addy that it would be fantastic if we were able to deal with the well-being issues within the school, not just from a sort of you know administrative point of view because it it could be more efficient, but also because of um, you know for those of us who teach modules that deal with things like law and psychology. And we're talking about, you know, emotional actors within the law, including, you know, practitioners, educators, the public, the judges, the jury, all of those different individuals. You know, I, I try to convey the idea that the students are also actors within this, you know, and that it's OK to experience certain emotions with certain types of topic. And so I think if, if we legitimise that, that, you know, they are part of the legal community, 
and you know, in the sort of law and emotion area, they also are actors within this sphere, you know. Um, so going back to what Heather said there just a moment ago about teaching uh, resilience as well, you know, that's a good point. We can have all the warnings and, you know, all of the triggers, um, but but also to sort of say, well, you know, this is part, you know, some areas are emotive. Uh, some of what you have to do is emotive in terms of assessments. And it's really just, you know, I guess trying to engender this literacy on emotion uh, across the student body, not just within, you know, a specific module that focuses on on those issues, you know. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant point, Martin. And it is about that that kind of emotional literacy and equipping students and staff with the vocabulary to talk about about these issues and fostering that kind of culture and that environment where it's okay to talk about these issues. And as you said, it is it is a legitimate topic of conversation. And I think the more that that can be embedded throughout the law degree, and that will be in lots of different ways, uh, you know, depending on the context, the subject and so on. Um, I think it's just to normalize it in some ways. I think the danger is if you have like a, 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 I've heard in the US of one one law school that had a, a module specifically on emotional intelligence for lawyers, say, and that that's great. But at the end of the day, then it's kind of like, well, I've done that, you know, I've, I've done my emotional bit. I'm finished with it. Whereas if we can just kind of normalize it throughout the whole of, uh, of the experience of legal education, I think that will be uh, more powerful in the long run. Thank you, Emma. Deirdre? <coughs> Hello, Emma. Hi. Um, Emma, thanks very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I do work with employers um, and I guess just a couple of comments, I guess, from their perspective. Um, we did have a, a roundtable employer session in the School of Law in February of, of last year. Um, and, you know, one of the comments they made, some of the employers made, was that they felt that actually within the school that we spoon fed students to a degree and that that made then the transition to the workforce much more of a shock for them. So they were nearly, I suppose, asking us to make students a bit more robust. Um, the other side of that is, you know, I've worked a lot of employers actually then have put in place specific well-being strategies. Um, and I know that one of our employers, Fintrue, who works within sort of tech but financial services sector, you know, they said that they noticed that graduates coming into the workplace, I'm not just talking about the School of Law, I'm talking about university in general, um, they were saying that they were really unprepared and are actually really, really struggling. So Fintrue had to actually put in place all these additional supports around, you know, new graduates coming into the workplace because, and I guess the question was, could we do more to build resilience, well-being, um, self-care regimes, you know, the students so that they begun to understood or understand how to take care of themselves to a degree and that that good practice then would stand them well within the workplace as well. So I guess it's just to say that this is something that uh, employers are very vocal on as well in terms of, I suppose, feeling that we can do more in terms of um, making students more robust, but that they will also do, you know, things within the workplace to try and aid that, that transition and ongoing development as well. That, that's actually really interesting to hear. Thanks, Deirdre. I think, um, as I said, I do have a slight concern that sometimes when, when it, and I'm not saying about these employees because obviously I don't know them, but employees, particularly law firms, generally have a little bit of a tendency to want robust people because they will, you know, expect 120% and maybe have quite unrealistic expectations from people. So I do have that slight concern. But I do agree about things like embedding self-care practices and really emphasising the value of those to students from a very early stage. Um, I've been quite surprised when I've talked to students, you know, how how little they, they are aware of, you know, their sleep patterns, their, their, their nutrition, real, real basics that you kind of assume they would have in place, but then they don't. And that they can have a just going out for a walk each day during lockdown, for example, um, you know, and it can have such an impact on them, such a positive impact and, and getting in those good habits early is really is really valuable, as is, for example, um, 
I, I, I like the idea of integrating contemplative practices in. So at, at the start of a lecture or seminar, having a moment to pause, do a little bit of a breathing exercise or a body scanning exercise, things like that, which actually sharpen focus uh, in, in any event. Um, so I, I do think there is lots that could be done, but I would just be wary about framing it too much around resilience because it is such a difficult concept in the way that it's it's used. But I think if we equip students so that they are emotionally literate and that they do care about their well-being, then actually um, that should enhance their ability to be autonomous and, and critically thinking individuals because it's actually looking at the whole person. So it should actually be something that's beneficial. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Deirdre, and apologies for barking the wind in the background there. Um, <laughs> the one thing that I was going to pick up on, on the back of Deirdre's question there, because I find it quite interesting, if we're looking at employers to be doing some of this and us to be doing some of this as, as academics and, and teachers in law schools, is an argument that this all needs to start a lot earlier, <laughs> that schools aren't doing enough along these, along these lines? You know that that the, this whole process has to start a lot earlier than it has started. Um, that's just my, one of my thoughts. Is there? Um, Martin has typed in the chat bar. Perhaps we need a mindfulness practitioner. A um, couple of agreements with the point I've just made. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you wish to add. Am or any other questions that anybody wants to add? I'd, I'd just say I, I agree with you, Heather, it does have to start earlier. Now, I don't know, I can only speak because I'm based in England, but my, my observation there was actually at, at sort of primary level, particularly, there was quite a large um, emphasis on um, emotional literacy and there were things like the social and emotional aspects of learning programme that sadly the government no longer funds. Um, that it decreased a little bit in, in secondary school, but I know from my own children they do do wellbeing lessons very regularly. But then actually um, when students were in further education, there seemed to be a real uh, lack of, of provision and uh, the, the, the focus seemed to shift more onto kind of preparing students for university in terms of academic preparation um, rather, than, rather than that kind of wider transition. Thank you, Emma. Um, John Stannard's just learning us in the chat bar there to the fact that we have a mindfulness room on floor nine of the law school building. Um, my view of that room, John, is that most of us don't actually have time to go up there. That's the great irony. We have a mindfulness room, but we're all so busy we seldom get time to actually go to the mindfulness yeah, room. That's exactly it. Um, I was, um, I, I'm far too busy ever to go up to the mindfulness room. Um, but when I retire, I might have time to use it. <laughs> Well, John, we, we, we shall look for you in there when the time comes. Any, <laughs> any other queries? At least we'll know where to find you. Any other queries, questions for Emma? OK, Emma, I'm, I'm not seeing any, but thank you um, for giving up your time today and, and for joining us and for giving us much food for thought going forward in, in terms of how this works with the student experience. So. Um, thank you to all our participants as well and for all the, the excellent questions. So um, thank you everybody and take care.